just a bit of housekeeping to start with. My name's Peter Holding. Um, and I'm attempting to manage this forum for everybody. You'll see up on your screens uh, the order of proceedings. Um, that's We're going to try and stick to that as closely as we can. Uh, in the bold writing just above the photograph, there's um, how to use Slido. Resilience, you type, you go into Slido with your, your app on the phone or on your computer and you type in Resilience Shepparton and that will bring you to a Slido question and answer and a poll page. You can do the poll and um, write any questions you want asked in there as we go through the forum. Um, we will have an opening introduction in a moment from Wendy Cohen, our CEO, and uh, she will do a welcome to country as well. Then we will have um, Rob Gordon talking on um, psychology of disasters. And then we'll have Peter Heyman, who's going to give us a talk on water availability and how climate change impacts on that. And hopefully a bit more specifically about how it might impact on the Golden River catchment. And finally, we'll have Dennis Ginnivan, who is a community organiser uh, and was instrumental in setting up Voices for Indi. And he will talk about how communities can come together and um, work on issues. It doesn't have to be political. It could be, uh, it could be anything, research on-farm activity, whatever you'd like to do. But uh, the important thing is to work together to build resilience. So um, if all of you can um, check out Slido, make sure that's working for you. I'll hand over to Wendy if she's available. I'll just check. Uh, Wendy's unmuted. Are you there, Wendy? I'm here, can you hear me? I can hear you, Wendy. Yes, there, I can see you too. Um, I'll hand over to Wendy Cohen now, our, our Farmers for Climate Action CEO. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, so much for attending our Community Resilience Forum, which has been run today for the communities of the Shepparton region in Victoria. Farmers for Climate Action warmly welcomes you all to what I'm sure will be a really interesting and stimulating series of discussions. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we virtually meet, the Yorta Yorta people, and pay respect to their leaders past, present and future. And indeed, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet across the country. Farmers for Climate Action is an organisation which works with farmers and their communities across rural and regional Australia. We support farmers to build climate literacy across communities, build networks and advocate for farmers taking climate action. Ours is a grassroots movement and we work closely with farming communities to identify and implement measures on and off farm to uh, tackle climate change and empower rural and regional Australians to work with low carbon solutions, adaptation and mitigation strategies, uh, and connect with climate and agricultural leaders and like-minded people in their areas to help create a sustainable and thriving rural and regional Australia. And when, when we speak of uh, community resilience and the power of a connected and strong community, we need look no further than the communities of Shepparton and the broader Golden Valley. Across Australia, we have long witnessed your spirit in the face of long-term drought significant water shortages and fire. Your response has been vivid and uh, a very compelling demonstration of what a community can achieve to overcome the most confronting challenges. Certainly the Goulburn Valley has long been known for its ability to address local challenges and prevail. And now with the COVID-19 crisis, you are again showing that you are resilient and innovative and connected. Farmers for Climate Action is helping uh, bring to you some expert advice and practical steps to support your response, recovery, and discuss ideas on how you might consider to tackle uh, climate change. We're also excited to start a conversation with you and hear from you uh, about what we might aim to achieve together. You are the Shepparton experts, you are the Goulburn Valley experts, 
and you know what is best for your community and your people. Dr. Rob Gordon, Dr. Peter Heyman and Dennis Ginnivan will lead fascinating discussions and I really thank them for their time and expertise. I'd also like to thank the team of FCA and the board members attending today. After the speakers, uh, we'll be touching on some ways that you can connect within your community and demonstrate your support for building even stronger communities, calling for our leaders to address climate change and support a thriving rural and regional Australia into the future. I really hope you enjoy the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, now we'll um, move straight on. We're a little bit early, but that's um, not going to matter, I don't think. So we'll move on to Dr. Rob Gordon now. Rob is a clinical psychologist and has had a long history in um, working with people in disasters. So some of the disasters worked with uh, uh, the Black Saturday episodes in Victoria with Marysville and other towns in that area. Um, the Christchurch earthquakes and many, many other bushfires around the, around the country, probably too many to mention. Uh, I think you'll find Rob's talk exceptionally interesting. Most people have so far to date. Uh, he, I won't actually get into it because he'll know a lot more about it than I will ever know. Um, but uh, I'd just like to thank Rob for the, for the effort that he's put into our forums. Um, it's, uh, without them, I think it would have been um, a bit flat. So thank you very much, Rob. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's been a while since I've been up at Shepparton, but uh, <laughs> nice to, to connect, even if remotely. Uh, when I was uh, working at the Children's Hospital, I was asked to be part of the, the uh, team that went out to help the Macedon community after Ash Wednesday. And uh, as part of that team, we visited there for four years, doing counselling work with families and children. And uh, halfway through that time, there was another fire in the Miraburra area, central Victoria. So, so I found myself at one stage visiting two communities two years apart in their recovery program. And I'd already noticed a lot of things as a psychologist that I had to stop and think about, uh, namely the importance of the social process and that uh, what's happening in the community reflected massively in what was happening in individuals' lives. And as I saw these two communities uh, two years apart, I began to see the common uh, threads and patterns in their recovery process. And that set me on the, on the path of trying to understand what, what creates this commonality. And if you read uh, case studies of disasters, right back to the beginning of the century, whenever they've been described, you'll see a series of absolutely typical events described. Uh, each disaster is, of course, uh, unique, but, but there are certain common things that happen. And I want to just give you a kind of uh, overview of how I understand this social process, uh, which is kicked off by the fact that we go into a state of very high threat. And it's to do with the adaptations we make to deal with an immediate confrontation and the, the repercussions of that as time passes. So I'm going to give it a, a simple description as though it's a nice tidy sequence. It's not. No human affairs are tidy, are they? And therefore, uh, we take this tidy sequence and then we can stop and think about what are the core processes we can see? And then that helps us to map how this process is going on at a particular time in a particular community. So I uh, will start off by sharing my screen. Um, and we should just now, yeah, let me see if I can find, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, you are, Rob, but you've got the Zoom meeting on the screen. So... Uh, that's better. Yep, now we're getting there. Now I have to put it on... Uh, just the screen. Presentation. Just the slide. 
That's it. And now I've got to change it, do I? Display sitting the other way around? Um, is that where you see yeah, it? Yeah, I, I just see community and personal stress disaster impact slide. Excellent. We're in business. So, in order to understand what happens in a community after a disaster, we need to have a few core ideas about what is a community. So, a community is a relatively stable group of people or series of groups of people who interact together, but they have uh, reasonably defined structures of some sort. So this could be the map showing the social connections between people. It could be in a town and different areas of the town. It could be in a di district with different, uh, different little communities. And the dots represent the people or it could be families. And the lines represent the bonds that hold them in relatively stable relationships. The first thing to think about is what are these bonds, social bonds created out of? This has important implications in the future. I've come to the conclusion that the actual stuff of social bonds is communication because communication is physical and it transmits something from one person to another and that creates a connection, a psychological and social connection. So these lines represent communicational bonds. Now that when people feel themselves to be closely interacting, it's probably because they've got something in common and that gives them a sense of identity and each little group has its own sense of identity. I apologize for that disappearing, but uh, nobody can fix it for me. But when we think about, uh, just go back to this earlier diagram for a second. If we think about this as describing locality, can you imagine uh, that even though the locality gives us a sense of identity, there are other dimensions to our social life where we actually have other issues in common that are very important to our identity, such as, for example, uh, political affiliations whether you're left or right wing uh, oriented, or dare I say attitudes to climate change, that would create a lot of different structures. And these don't collide with geographical distribution. So you might here have a lot of interaction with your neighbor, but when it comes to climate action, uh, your neighbor's got very different views. Uh, and so you're actually far apart from your neighbor on the climate dimension even though you're close in the locality direction. And you might have another dimension where these two people interested in climate action suddenly find they're very far apart in terms of uh, football. One of them might, uh, God bless them, vote, vote for or uh, Barry for Collingwood. And uh, what can you do? But these relationships are complex. They are very close in one way and far apart in another. So, the normal community structure has this multi-dimensional character that allows us to coexist where we've got commonalities and closeness on one dimension and on other dimensions we're far apart and we've got quite different views, maybe even conflicting views, but then there's always another one in which we come together. And so you can say this is why the community holds together because it, if there isn't something holding me to a community, I'll probably up stakes and leave. Now, the, the important point to emphasize that this is the social structure within which we live our everyday lives. And therefore, this system is regulated and organized and has a whole sort of rules and procedures, fundamentally to put survival off the agenda. We've got specialist groups to deal with survival. We've got police and ambulance and plumbers to unblock toilets and doctors to fix up our, our illnesses and so on. And so the rest of us can just get on and be psychologists or farmers or whatever. We don't have to do everything. And this division of labor comes about because there's an organization that specializes some people to deal with threats and the rest of us can do what we want to do. Therefore, this is designed on the assumption that we don't go through our life every day wondering if we'll make it to bedtime. Now, the problem comes when you have a disaster, big or small, which is by definition a threat. 
threat to life and property of varying degrees has a community-wide impact, which brings survival into question and therefore puts on the agenda something that shouldn't be on the agenda. And therefore that disrupts all the community functions and all the communication processes that are based on normal, normal activities. And so you can see that the normal relationships we have are not organized, designed and adapted to a dramatic survival situation. So when the bushfire descends on the town, uh, people just don't go into a well-oiled machine, they run round and improvise, unless of course they've done a lot of disaster preparedness. But usually we're too busy to get on with that sort of stuff, dealing with our normal everyday stuff, we'll leave that to the fireys. And so now when we go into this state, we go into what I call uh, emergency mode, survival mode. We have the adrenaline going. <clears throat> and what we'll see is that people will actually drop out of this everyday structure and go into a tight focus on what's required to physically survive. Let's watch it happen. So let's say these are the uh, Liberal voters and these are the Labor voters, or should I say country party voters and Labor voters. As a bushfire comes, they might have political views about burn-offs and so on, but here, here comes the fire and this shadow is the warning. You can see as the warning hits, they drop out of their political affiliation and all become orange. They don't even care whether you're barracked for Collingwood or not. We're all orange. We're all about to be imp imp impacted. And then as the impact occurs here, you can see actually all of those bonds cease to connect. We're all in survival mode. We're all improvising, even if we're sitting next to each other. I remember a description in the Macedon pub as the fire front went over in Ash Wednesday. There were 200 people in the saloon area and not a word was spoken. And not like the Hollywood movies with people screaming, there was complete silence because everyone is actually sitting there holding their dogs and cats and children and chooks and goats and whatever and thinking, am I going to die? And this is a really important moment now that means everybody's gone into themselves. They will comfort whoever is near them, but each person is in this highly individualized state. And this is what adrenaline does. And people will have the closest connection with each other in this moment, but they might not even introduce themselves. And when the fire subsides, they part, They've had a life-changing experience. They don't even know their names. They never see each other again. It's a very unusual situation. And so I call this the moment of debonding. And you can see that the pre-existing complex, I think of it like a crystal lattice of multi-dimensional structure has evaporated in favor of immediate survival. It's not to say people won't work together, but it has no bearing on their previous relationships. It's completely determined by the immediate situation. And so this moment of debonding disrupts the continuity of the social and emotional physical relationships. But the problem is people are so focused on what's going on around them, they're not thinking of the social system. That's normally something we take for granted. So they're not aware that they're debonded, they're just very busy doing what they have to do. It, this debonding affects everything that people take for granted and therefore the self-focus excludes an awareness of what's been lost. Now, if we don't know we've lost something, it may well not occur to us to get it back. And so the reversal of this debonding is neither automatic, immediate or complete. But instead of going back from debonding back to normal pre-existing social structure, what actually happens is everyone's in this tremendously highly charged state. They're all high on adrenaline. They've all had this massive experience. And so they go into a new social structure that's not the same as the other one. I call it the state of fusion. Everyone comes together. They all start talking to each other. They talk about what's gone on, who's safe, who needs to be helped, where's so-and-so, what do we need? who's got a phone, et cetera. All the committee, some people will just immediately evacuate, but the core of people who stay go into this tight, unified, supportive, heroic 
uh, social fusion, I call it. Instead of a structure of complexity, it's a fusion. We're all based around a common experience. And anyone who's been there uh, an hour or two after a bushfire or a day or two will, will know what I mean. Now, this is a system where the communication is highly charged and emotional because it's all about the threats and the, the, the consequences. Uh, so this is not a good structure for strategic planning and, uh, and uh, validating information and checking out. So you see that what happens here is that there's a constructive side starts to emerge, uh, rapid dissemination of urgent information about who needs help. But on the same token, you get uh, a structure that's absolutely ideally uh, designed to transmit rumors and myths. And you get all sorts of distorted rumors and myths start to circulate because the, the information that travels furthest is the most emotional in this state. Uh, so it's got both these aspects, very helpful and also the beginnings of a problem. And what we find is that any social system that comes into being will need to form a boundary around it. And this boundary forms very quickly within, I would say, within a day or two. Um, and I think it's a very fundamental principle that all of the representatives of the agencies and groups that need to be participating in the recovery are present at the, at the community in the fusion when that boundary forms. And then they are, are seen as members and participants in the whole process. If you uh, try to come in later, like we did two weeks afterwards in Macedon, you have to puncture that boundary to get in. And then you're felt to be a foreign body for a long time. And anyone who's tried to work in a disaster uh, a little bit late will know what that feels like. Uh, whereas if you're in there in the beginning, you're one of us, you were here on the day, etc. Uh, and people might re-emerge in their previous identities, but they're not actually organised. Uh, everything is being improvised, everything's being innovated around the immediate disaster consequences. Now, I think this is an enormously powerful social structure because the bonds are incredibly powerful because people are in high adrenaline, they're having massively important experiences. There's tremendous need, there's a lot of distress. You'll get a few people, a few outliers that won't connect. And they often come in much later, but the, the bulk of people are right in it, trying to work out what they need to do. If you've got some trained people, they will start a nucleus of, of organized activity. If not, people will start inventing the wheel for themselves. And, and uh, that's a tight, strong bond with a strong sense of identity. And the real task of recovery is how does the community get from this fusion back to a complex, multi-dimensional social fabric that meets the needs of everyday life? Because this doesn't meet the needs of everyday life. It meets the needs of the immediate post-disaster consequences. And I think of this as a, a, a need for a process of differentiation, of, of making differences, of separating, of organizing, of giving roles. Uh, sorry, I've gone to the uh, completely wrong end of the, uh, we'll just have to go through this, sorry. Uh, social differentiation. So. For this social differentiation process, the recovery needs to go from fusion to complex social structure. So we need transition from uh, fusion to a new sustainable community structure to integrate old structures and new structures that are emerging out of the needs for the uh, recovery process. It's got to serve recovery, but also create a new future. Now, Here's a fundamental principle. If you've got a system that needs to differentiate and you don't get about it and do it in a constructive way and manage it consciously, there is uh, an alternative method. You can differentiate very nicely through hostility, antagonism, competition, anger, and negative emotion. And when I really looked into this, because this happens after every disaster, conflict breaks out at a certain point and it starts emerging around all sorts of issues. And it always happens in one way or another. And when I looked into this, uh, reading back in social theory and 
various uh, theories about social processes, you find there's a long tradition going back to the 50s of research that shows that, that if you put a group together and they don't have enough boundaries and organisation, it could be too many rats in a cage, it could be experiments with undergraduates in a, in a room that uh, are left to themselves for a, a while, uh, or, or other communities, then the default way in which organisation occurs is by conflict. That conflict has a function in social systems. It creates boundaries where people need it. In my work with adolescents, uh, you realise that that's what they're doing in their families. They need to differentiate. And if they don't come to their parents periodically say, uh, excuse me, mum and dad, I've noticed I've become a lot more mature lately. Do you think we could renegotiate my allowance and my uh, responsibilities? I think I could probably do a bit more around the house and have a slight uh, increase. What do you say? They don't do that because they're not aware that they're more mature. All they're aware of is my insufferable parents won't allow me enough freedom. Uh, and so they go into conflict to establish their freedom, which of course doesn't always work that well. Uh, so with this understanding that there's a primitive social process that uses conflict to create in a blind instinctive way, a, a, a need for separation and distance, because there's a threat in being all alone I lose my identity, but there's equally a threat of being submerged in a group, I lose my identity. And so people who are alone reach out and uh, uh, to avoid getting depressed and, and unhappy. And people who are engulfed go into conflict to, to get people to back off and get a bit of space. And so what we see is that as time passes, the myth that we all went through the same thing is showing up because we didn't. Everybody had their own disaster. Everybody's consequences are different. And as these different consequences are communicated across the bonds, the tension grows and the bonds break. After uh, Black Saturday, if you went up to Kinglake uh, from the Melba Highway, when you got up towards the top, you found in the moonscape of blackened trees and rubble, you found one house standing with a, a, a piece of galvanised iron wired to a couple of star droppers near the, the road. And in dripping paint, there was a sign saying, this house survived because we stayed and fought. You know, it's a very simple triumphant statement, but it also makes a judgment about why the other houses got lost. So you can imagine the people that evacuated, lost their house, nearly died on the, on the evacuation. Uh, when they come back and see this, they're not going to feel too happy about their neighbours. It, it also happens about uh, the difference between two people who lost their house. One person lost a new brick veneer with well-insured new furniture. Another person lost a small cottage that their family lived in for three generations that was full of heirlooms. You cannot compare the losses. You can't compare them financially, but most of all, you can't compare the emotional impact. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are very complex issues, but in this adrenaline fusion state, we're not geared for complexity. We're geared for black and white judgment, immediate action and simplistic understanding. And so I call these lines that differentiate people through the different consequences, cleavage planes. You know, in a diamond, you have a very strong uh, crystal structure and uh, you hit it the wrong way with the hammer, you'll chip the hammer. But there's a certain angle where the, the molecular bonds in this structure are weakened. And if you hit it on that uh, angle, it'll, it'll split, it'll cut. So that's the cleavage plane. And we can cut diamonds if we hit it on the cleavage plane. And so the cleavage planes open up in this fuge state as time goes by, as people stumble across differences. And if we're not careful, those differences translate into conflict. So it's very common. I've heard this story in uh, after Ash Wednesday in La Batouche. And I've also heard it more recently in uh, some of the Black Summer bushfire areas. Uh, a, a truck of hay comes up to a farmer and uh, everybody sees this truck arrive 
and everybody's got an opinion as to whether this person actually needs the hay because they all think they know how much hay he's got in his shed and what was burnt and what wasn't. Most of the time they don't really know, they only know what's been said. And so uh, sometimes they'll be really angry and feel uh, this guy doesn't deserve this hay because he's got a shed full of hay. Uh, but uh, what they don't know is he's bought the hay and he's suggesting his neighbour's uh, cattle because they've been burnt. The, pa the paddock's been burned. Uh, you know, these sort of complexities, but, but uh, they don't wait to find out, they, they jump to judgment. We see how in this fusion, there's a loss of privacy and the communication of too much information. So people understand too much, well, think they do. They know what grants people got and they have opinions as to whether they deserve it. And they, those aren't just thoughtful opinions, they're emotional opinions and, and gossip and rumour. The way we give assistance, if we're not careful, will actually sever bonds because some people will qualify and some won't, and that'll create resentment and distress. And so what we see is from a, probably a couple of weeks on to uh, really, right, if we're not careful, right through the recovery process, cleavage planes open up. In Black Saturday, you could see them opening up in the third and fourth years around the final distribution of the money from the fund, for instance, uh, and issues around the, the redevelopment and rebuilding of buildings and so on. The community would have strong differences of opinion. And so what's actually happening is that these cleavages are actually engaging in a, a destructive process of differentiation. We can't stop the differentiation, it must happen. We can't stay in the fusion. And this will be destructive if we don't actually manage it. So there are fundamental uh, principles about cleavages. First of all, that they are serving to differentiate the, the subgroup. So as soon as we hear of conflict, we've got to step back and say, what's the cleavage here? What's the issue? What are the subgroups? Uh, how, how else can we help them be clear about having a separate identity? So I've done it again. Uh, uh, just, uh, sorry about this. I have to practice my skills better. Uh, getting a bit wound up here with my stories. So here we go. They differentiated court to, according to perceptions. You see, we live with real differences, differences of income, differences of political interest, differences of uh, attitudes to climate change. We live with each other somehow or another. But it's the way they're mobilised and perceive that's important. Now, we can work with perceptions, can't we? They cut across pre-existing structures because they don't respect pre-existing relationships or pre-existing communication networks. And so therefore, they alienate subgroups from each other. They fracture the support systems. There's been research since the Second World War that's consistently shown the most important protective factor for any form of physical or mental health you want to think about is good social support. Cleavage planes arbitrarily cut across your support system because your best friend didn't lose their house or did lose their house or was insured or wasn't insured or did evacuate or didn't evacuate and you're on the other side. They impede planning and decision making because I don't want to talk to you because I'm angry with you. And therefore they start to politicize what should be a psychosocial process. I really can't emphasize this enough. I've seen over my years of consulting all around Australia and, and uh, New Zealand, I've seen it, it, once the political system starts to come in and cut across this, you get uh, uh, the psychosocial recovery process derailed according to larger agendas and the pre-existing political priorities. So I think it's really important that we therefore think if we manage the psychosocial differentiation through shared communication systems and change structures and manage these differences within a holistic understanding that we're all together in this community, the cleavage planes lose their function. They don't have to differentiate the community, we're doing it on a different basis. And so what we get is this idea of the formation of a community recovery committee 
that can assist all the differently affected groups in the community to get together and advocate for their need, needs and maybe get, have a, a delegate in the community recovery committee. Because what you realise is that normally governments of all levels uh, have relatively little to do with people's lives. It's a principle of, of uh, a liberal democracy that we, uh, we have governments that keep out of our affairs, don't we, as much as possible, or we re-elect somebody else if they get too nosy. Uh, so we have very limited interactions with government in very highly structured ways. But after a disaster, I'm going to need, for the first time, enormous intricate engagement with multiple government systems at the same time. And I don't understand the system, and this, the system doesn't understand how to meet these non-usual, non-normal business needs that they have to, because governments can't practice disasters very well. Well, maybe you'd say, well, they're getting pretty uh, experienced at it now. Yes, but normally you'll find uh, while we can uh, practice emergency uh, response and so on with sirens and lights, we can't really practice recovery. We'd have to take government departments offline for uh, weeks and months at a time to see if we could get all the systems going. So in fact, they're always being improvised. So if we don't have sufficient input from the community, the decisions won't be right. And I could give multiple examples. And so this uh, community recovery system that validates the different groups and needs and creates a forum for them to talk together and communicate and plan and, and uh, organize themselves and develop a, a dedicated communication system. That's the green lines here. That's designed to serve the recovery needs. And this then becomes a nucleus of a creative and constructive uh, differentiation process that leads us towards the new multi-dimensional social structure because the sad fact is after a disaster, we're really not going to go back to how things were before. There will always be some big differences. So we can pull out some principles. Constructive differentiation is supported by community participation, validating and bringing in emergent groups, not going into conflict with them, creating a new communication structure to serve recovery, creating a common fund of information that bridges the cleavages. Active management of social tensions and inequalities through uh, initiating social uh, programs, social activities of various sorts, and most importantly, consistency in relief and assistance. Now, I've described this as though it's a sequence. And if you have something like a bushfire, it is a sequence, but actually, uh, it's not as tidy as that, uh, and I, uh, I, I was up in the Shepparton uh, in the latter stages of uh, the millennial drought, and I uh, presented this model to a group of uh, local workers and, and uh, there were farmers there and people, and I said, this is what we see in normal, disa uh, normal disasters. And they said to me, uh, well, we recognise all those processes, but they're all happening at the same time in different parts of the community. It's not a sequence. And of course, a drought is like a disaster without a starting point. It just, things slowly build up and some people get into trouble before others. And there was a whole lot of dynamics around uh, the irrigators uh, were in trouble before the dry land farmers. So then we need the debonding and cleavage and so on. And then the dry land farmers go into debonding when they're, uh, the the irrigators are starting to reform and then this conflict between the dry land and the irrigators and so on and so forth. So, so I drew this diagram to say this can help us map these as processes. We will debond whenever we're under a high threat. If we debond, we're going to bounce out of that into fusion. If we don't differentiate the fusion rapidly and build it into a constructive recovery process, then we're going to split in cleavages, which will then create further debonds, et cetera. And so you can sort of see how this is a, a sort of blind process going on in the community. But if we step back and use these core ideas, which are really about the way in which normal relationships are changed by threat, then we can map what's happening and that helps us develop 
some kind of community strategies. So we can come up with a few principles. Preparation and planning reduce the bonding because we go into practice routines instead of into emergency mode. The degree of debonding is what determines the degree of fusion. So the more we hold our role and know what we're doing, the less we're actually uh, debonding. We're actually going into a specialised part of our, our practice functioning, and that limits the fusion. The fusion is the major cause of the post-disaster disruption, not the debonding, because if we debond and go back into the previous structure, by dint of uh, good organisation and lots of practice, there's not a problem. And this is what emergency services are trained to do. But the normal community doesn't practice enough for that. So we go into a fusion and that's the problem. The cleavage planes are based on perceived collective differences. So it's a really important we be thinking ahead as to how people perceive each other, how we understand how the information passes around. And information about commonalities, what we've got in common, in spite of the cleavages, sutures them up. And I could give anecdotes of what's happened in, in meetings and how different issues have been brought to the foreground and people suddenly realise, oh, it's not the way I thought it was. And uh, circulating information promotes communication. Communication facilitates bonds and common action creates constructive differentiation. And all of this happens through groups. So we've got to work with groups, create groups, have group meetings, etc. And now we can take these basic principles and we can unpack a series of strategies. I won't describe these, uh, the, the slides are all available to you. So, but, but you can see, you can come up with a series of strategies uh, to prevent or terminate the deep bonding. You can then come up with another series of strategies to minimize the fusion around preserving roles and promoting structures and so on. Uh, then you can actually be gathering information. I think of it as creating a sense organ uh, to pick up the cleavage planes at their first uh, sort of emergence. Because I think it's very important that multiple groups communicate with each other during recovery. Groups that don't normally need to talk to each other. Uh, people like uh, linesmen rebuilding uh, the, the electricity infrastructure. They will often hear things about the circumstance of people uh, in the houses where they are who may well not have made any contact with anyone else. It would be great if they come back to the recovery tent and say, hey, listen, Mrs. Bloggs out there on such and such a street is uh, looking pretty upset. Uh, and then they can send the Red Cross visitors out and so on. And then as we pick up these cleavages, create environments, circulate inf information where we can suture them up with commonalities and then promote our constructive differentiation through a series of strategies. Now, I just want to say a couple of things about arousal and stress before we open up for questions. I want to start with this picture, which is uh, this graph was first drawn in about the 1920s from experiments on rats. And it's the famous bell curve, which describes how a lot of human functions operate. Now, this axis on the graph describes how well we perform. The higher on the graph we are, the better we perform. This uh, axis describes how highly aroused we are. All right? And, and uh, you can see that there's an optimal level of arousal. And if we get too highly aroused, things don't work too well. So if the arousal's too low, we're either depressed and we can't get out of bed, or if we manage to turn up to a meeting like this and we're low aroused, we're bored. Uh, as our arousal increases, if people get more interested, they start to think, they start to concentrate, they're becoming effective. And then we get into our comfort zone, where our arousal, there's a zone of our arousal where uh, we're doing all right. So hopefully we're up around about here, but if I keep talking without drawing breath for about the next two and a half hours and giving you people lots of new information, it doesn't matter how good it is, you're gonna be coming right down the other side and you're getting really stressed and now you're not functioning very well. You're coming down here. Uh, and uh, after you get too stressed, you're not functioning much better than someone who's yawning and bored and not taking anything in. And if the arousal gets too high, things start to go wrong. And this is you get into the trauma zone. And if it's too high altogether, you just can't do anything, you're in a state of shock. So 
the aim is to actually keep in this comfort zone. Bring arousal down if it's too high, bring it up if it's too low. Now, the, this is uh, the important fact about stress because the moment we're in stress, we're, the arousal's pushing us outside our comfort zone. And when we have the emergency mode, we're way outside our comfort zone. Uh, adrenaline liberates these reserves, puts us into this incredibly tight focus on the, the things around us, the perceptions. And we, we think in, in images and actions and we don't remember sequences. We just have what are called flashbulb memories that usually don't have what happened, but what you uh, saw coming towards you. You have simple pre-programmed instinctive emotions. And most of all, the feedback system is shut down in uh, high arousal. We are specialized for survival at the expense of normality. And that's not a healthy state. Have a look at these guys. They're rescuing a woman from a cinema fire in Calcutta, back when it used to be called Calcutta. I cut it out of the paper. This man's in adrenaline. Have a look at him. You can see the narrow focus, tunnel vision, is an inseparable part of adrenaline. The tunnel is locked onto the, uh, the aspect of the environment that is most relevant to the threat. In this case, probably the door or the exit or the ambulance. And if you have a look at how aware is he of the environment, he's not. And many people will say, after they look back on a disaster, that the decisions they made in this early stage were not really good decisions because they weren't put in the context, they weren't strategic, they weren't thinking far enough ahead. They were really just reactive to the immediate circumstances. I've had farmers say that all the work they did in the first few months had to be redone because it wasn't properly thought out. Uh, and, and so this is a liability. We want people to get out of high arousal as soon as we can, uh, because otherwise they're only good for fighting a fire and staying alive. They're not good for starting to rebuild. Have a look at their faces. You can see that what seems to go along with this narrow focus is a kind of curious blankness of expression on the face. Now, people sometimes say they're panicking. They're not panicking. They're in high arousal because there's no emotion. This man is in emotion because he's a bystander. They're in role. So all the arousal is going into goal-directed action, doing what they have to do. As long as they can do that, there will be no emotion. But if we stop these guys and say, you can't come through here, they're gonna explode in rage. So you get in this adrenaline state, you get this very fragile balance between action and emotion. If I can do what I need to do, or what I think I need to do, everything will drain out. If I can't, I'm going to go into emotion, maybe anger or despair. Uh, and if you have a look at the social connectedness, you can see that there is some connection between these guys, but they haven't coordinated enough. They haven't stopped long enough. It would have taken them five seconds to get this poor woman in a better hold, wouldn't it? And this poor guy's gonna do his back in. He's probably holding all the weight. But this guy's got the, he's running the pace, isn't he? But he's not carrying the weight. Uh, so this is the, the, the way in which the social system is uh, seriously compromised by this. They're, they're just going towards debonding. They haven't debonded because they've got a common goal. Now. This state, uh, adrenaline uses up all our reserves. And anyone who's been in that state for a long time knows you go, 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 and then just collapse. And then you take a long time to recover. Now that state doesn't last long enough to go through the, the recovery process. So the, the definition of the acute stress, which generates adrenaline is, I've got a huge problem, and if I don't do something straight away, it's gonna get a lot bigger. But once the fire's out and we've found accommodation and we take stock of the damage, we move into the second state, which I call endurance mode, because this is where we've got a, a continuing stress state, which is defined as I've got a huge problem, but there's nothing I can do to fix it this afternoon. I'm just gonna have to keep working for an incredibly long time to sort it all out. And we go into a different state, a different chemistry using cortisol comes into play. And instead of using up reserves, cortisol draws the energy from our own tissues and we can start chewing our own bodies up for a long time when we would fall over 
from a depletion of reserves on adrenaline. And, and this means we, we're not in such a highly charged state, but we go into a state where we can do anything that is automatic, routine, familiar. What I call a zombie state. We've all been in it, where you're just plugging through the huge workload you've got to do. You get narrowed down and what cortisol does is it actually reorganizes everything to just keep the core processes going. That's why cortisol is implicated in serious health consequences uh, well down the track. We can go for a long time, but eventually, uh, if we're in stress for too long, we're gonna get diabetes and heart disease and cancer and multiple sclerosis and a whole lot of other things that are vaguely implicated with extended periods of stress in our lives. And uh, it's very important that we have our eye on that when the recovery starts, not wait for there to be a whole range of uh, health problems break out several, maybe 10 years later. So uh, we can engage in narrow problem solving, thinking about familiar ideas. Uh, we either have emotional numbness interrupted by outbursts of emotion, but basically we've reduced the feedback. And so we're not thinking about ourselves, we think about what we've got to do. And in this state, you can see, uh, these are a couple uh, uh, German tourists who have been kidnapped uh, by Filipino terrorists and held hostage for six weeks. And you can see that's a cortisol state. There's nothing I can do about it, I just have to endure. And you can see the blank face showing the lack of feedback, the disconnection from themselves and it from each other. There's no uh, excess uh, signaling of emotion, which we get from face or gesture. You can look at the bright eyes, they're really on guard. They don't know what's gonna happen next, but uh, there's nothing going on. You can imagine how the relationship would need to be rehabilitated afterwards. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the whole deterioration of relationships is a great risk during this period of extended stress. So the general stress responses in thinking are, we move to a, a poorer, more problem solving, less verbal, more visual thinking. We can do anything that's familiar, anything we've seen before. We lose flexibility and lateral thinking and creative problem solving. We, we function according to emotional associations and therefore we become judgmental, jump to conclusions. Uh, make critical comments. And you can see how this starts off in the fusion and then goes through into the cleavages. And this is not a good basis for making good long-term plans. In the emotional uh, sphere, you, in, in, as long as you're in high stress, you have instinctive pre-programmed primitive emotions. These ones, fear, anger, distress, and you lose the capacity for socially meaningful emotions, regret, disappointment, compassion, resignation and all these things that help us hold together with people who are in a different situation from us. We become reactive. And so um, these kind of emotionalities uh, create further tensions. So I think it's such an important thing that the people become self-aware that they're in a stress state and they need to manage it. And what's more, that they need to manage each other's stress and that the agencies have a strategy for understanding that. And so I've got uh, it's just a simple set of points about communicating with stressed people. And the first thing is, don't try and do any business with them before you uh, bring the arousal down. How do you know the arousal's up? Uh, arousal is to do with muscular tension. So if the person's got a high pitched voice and talk to you like all of this all the time and hardly uh, putting their sentences together, they're obviously very stressed and on high arousal. Uh, and so uh, if they, they don't make sense, if they're angry. So all you need to do is don't try and tell them anything until their arousal's down. Listen to them, help them clarify what they want to say. And in your reactions, even if they're getting to you and being annoying and being angry and uh, even abusing you, be slow, methodical, drop your tone of voice, pause between your sentences, Ask them to clarify why they are so angry with you or angry with somebody else. Be very careful that you don't use jargon because to, well, our jargon is just ordinary language, but the jargon for another person has to be pre-interpreted. Sorry about that phone. Uh, has to be processed. 
and therefore it, they can't do it in this state because they're uh, in this visual system of familiar things. They can't work out new ideas. And so therefore we've got to talk simply. And I think the guideline for me is talk the way you would to an early primary school child because nine years old is when children start using concepts, complex ideas. They move from sums about apples and oranges to algebra. Uh, so we don't talk down to them. We're not treating them as children. We're using the complexity of language. Uh, and if you're like me, when I'm highly stressed and I try to read a, an accountant's letter or something, I can't understand it. So I know it's in English, but I just can't understand it. I need somebody to break it down and treat me like a nine-year-old and, and explain what all these unfamiliar words are. So this is a simple communication task. And you'll find that if you engage like that, the stress comes down, you connect with the person and they can start thinking. Finally, a couple of slides on resilience. I spend a whole uh, half day trying to look the word up and understand what it means. And one thing that happens in bushfire communities is that when people who are experts come in and start talking about a resilience, they feel like throwing things at them because uh, it's used as this kind of, you shouldn't be upset, you should be resilient. But actually resilience comes from the Latin word sale, meaning reeds, reeds in the river. When the flood comes, the reeds flex and bend and deform and flat. And then when the flood recedes, they come back up again, whereas the gum trees are swept away and broken and, and gone. And I think the essence of resilience is that we allow our fundamental values to flex and deform, but not be broken. What is essential? Our commitment to the quality of life and relationships. Hanging on and understanding what really gives our lives meaning and value. That the relationships with our family and community uh, have to be valued and protected at all costs because these are the things that can't be replaced and so they are the things that we must commit ourselves to protect there's a whole detailed lot of contributors to resilience that's come out of the research which i won't go through at the moment and we can say for each of these we can put uh, something on the other side which will happen in a state of heightened stress so that's resilience versus desilience. And that's where I think organizing the social system so that we support each other and hold together and gives us maximum opportunity for recovery. So look, I'll stop there and see if uh, anyone uh, might uh, have any questions. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, we actually do have a question, it's a, a bit involved and we've probably got a minute, so we'll, we'll ask it comes from Tammy Atkins, and it's about the fact that, um, not so much about the Shepparton area, but about the bushfire areas, especially in northeast Victoria, where they've had uh, extended period of stress from the summer fires, and that's then gone into the COVID-19 issues. Yeah. And now, that, now they've got uh, a downturn in tourism and economic situation. Yeah. She wants to know what will the what will the recovery process look like for these communities and how can we help? Uh, what it'll look like is even more messy than normal uh, <laughs> because we've got rolling threats, haven't we? We've got the threat of COVID. Uh, then we've got the isolation. Isolation is a threat and we can see how isolation, if we're not careful, cuts across the resources for recovery, which are communal interaction. Uh, and uh, so therefore, and then economic downturn brings a whole new layer of threats and, and problems. Uh, what we've been doing is we've been uh, recording webinars that sort of tackle some of these issues and, and, and encourage electronic medium, but we know in the back blocks of East uh, Gippsland, there's not good coverage and uh, people don't always have good IT equipment. It's gonna make it very difficult. I think what's uh, gonna happen, it's gonna slow the recovery down um, and uh, therefore we're really looking at how, how do we provide supports to people during this period until we can start to reactivate. Uh, the, the community recovery committees are forming and uh, they're gonna be crucial. Uh, but yes, it's absolutely right. Uh, and this is a, a new thing we're having to learn about as we go. 
but it's it's about communication. We have to find what ways we can communicate together, work on these issues. Very good. All right. Um, we'll now move on uh, to Peter Heyman. Uh, Peter is here somewhere. I've just um, just got the wrong thing there. Come on, unmute. I'm trying to unmute you, Peter. Just doesn't want to work. Right now, we've got you on. Now I've got you on. Got you unmuted. Yes. Um, now I'd like to welcome Peter. Peter works at SADI, which is the Research Institute in South Australia. We had a long history in water matters. Uh, I should stress not political water matters though, just the physical aspects. So um, we won't be taking questions on um, the Murray-Darling Basin because it's kind of irrelevant to this discussion. Um, but we will be prepared to discuss anything to do with uh, the impact of climate change on how much water you might get in your rivers. Uh, and the physical aspects. Uh, I hope that clarifies things for everybody. Um, now, Peter's given a number of talks across the country and they've always been very interesting. One I saw in Wagga, and I imagine you'll cover that today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Peter. Are you there, Peter? Yeah, um, I'll try and share my screen. Um... Well, you may be able to. I've been trying to get. Um, are you there, Fiona? Can you make Peter a. So I have host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, yeah. Are you there, Fiona? I have just um, enabled the co host. Sorry Thank about you. that. So share. Okay, so can people see. My yes. PowerPoint slide there. Impact of climate change and climate variability on river inflows and water availability. Fantastic. Okay. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, I really uh, want to make it really clear how pleasing it is to firstly um, be part of Farmers for Climate Action to, 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 to join with you in this but also, I guess, to follow a psychologist on this discussion. I think it's really important that um, we acknowledge that these are, these are um, environmental issues, there's uh, economic issues and so on, but in the end, it's people issues. And um, we really want to, uh, I think it's, it's, it's really good to um, have that emphasis. So I've just got a slide here that um, is, I guess making this this point that it would be nice to be able to say this is exactly what will happen at a local scale with a changing climate. I do have some a little bit of information on that, but in the end, I think a more important point is the eminent climate scientist Wally Broker makes a point: the climate system is an angry beast, and we're poking it with sticks. Uh, Ross Garner made this point that basically we don't know what's going to happen and that's why we need to reduce emissions because we are going into deep uncertainty about how th things can will happen. We know that we are changing the radiative properties of the atmosphere. What that will do to rainfall in southern Australia is worrying but remains uncertain. We know there are physics um, that tell us that uh, less rainfall has a magnified effect on runoff and the seasonality of that rainfall and so on. So it, it's not a case where we don't know anything about the future, but a key point is that we need to be cautious about saying it will be exactly 11.3% reduction or something like this. It, 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 there's, a, there's a danger in false precision and uncertainty in, the, in this area. So I'm saying we need an adult respectful conversation and uh, Wendy opened this by saying this is about a conversation. Um, I think it's, we do need humility. We don't know everything and that's actually a good place to start that um, we're standing together with an uncertain future here. We need to be clear about the confidence and the uncertainty. There's some things that we do know. 
about the fact that we're changing the radiative properties of the atmosphere that will change temperature and that will change rainfall and runoff. And we can have some aspects of understanding that, but, but we need to be careful about being overconfident on things that we're uncertain about in, in, in this adult respectful conversation. Um, I think we need to acknowledge the variability of the past and, and that especially with rural communities, who deeply live through year by year, decade by decade variability, sometimes the conversation is, is, is as if um, with a computer model about the future, that trashes all the past experience and deep learning from that and so on. So we need to acknowledge that variability of the past. Uh, I've also said there, and this is um, to be curious and apply skepticism to both the contrarian and, and the alarmist. I mean, I, I'll, people will call me an alarmist, but let's, let's just say it's worth being curious and asking why are people saying what they're saying? What's the evidence and so on? There's this nice line that we are naturally born lawyers, not scientists. Even those of us who um, have been trained in science we tend to take a position and defend it on a whole lot of things. Um, so we, and, and part, and I guess a, a line in science is that the most important, this is Asimov said, the most important line in science isn't Eureka as I found it. It's, that's interesting. We're something surprising. And we need to acknowledge that this remains um, a surprising, surprising area. And finally there, I've got, um, from that well-known climate scientist Tennyson, tread softly for your tread on my dreams. We need to recognize that we are talking at times about an ex existential threat and the idea that um, we should just uh, um, cajole people here. We need to be very aware that these are people's livelihoods and especially in rural areas. And my sense is sometimes people are asking farmers to make, a, um, major adaptation, major preemptive adaptation changes and so on, that I don't see those same people making in their own lives necessarily. Um, so, I, I, and, and so I think that th this is an important part of the respectful conversation. Part of how I talk with uh, rural, with, with farmer friends about this, and, and, um, and some farmers who probably um, find, find it annoying having this discussion too, but what what I say is, look, and this isn't my idea. Um, this is, came from Stephen Schneider, who's a, who's a climate scientist, um, who, who had this point that you can have an argument with a child on the beach as to what destroyed the sandcastle. Was it the wave or the tide? And you go backwards and forwards and say it was, it was the wave that did it, it was the tide that did it. It's always the wave that destroys, that destroys the, sand, the sandcastle. But on a rising tide, the wave does more damage. It's not a case of variability, year to year variability or individual weather events, which are the wave and the long-term underlying trends in climate change, which is the tide. It's not a case of either or. And sometimes we have this sort of um, uh, futile discussion after a bushfire or a drought of, was that climate change or was that natural variability as if we can say it's either one or the other. Now, we can, there's a very interesting science of detection and so on, but, but I think we need to be cautious about this notion of dividing this off into two separate things. These are two processes that are happening and we need to acknowledge them together and it's useful to have that, that notion. As a grape grower said to me, sometimes it's a dog that destroys the sandcastle. So there's, there's other things like low grape prices and other issues that come along and, and affect you. On this issue, I think that um, it was really interesting having Gordon talk about the, 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 the short-term aspects of a bushfire and the ramifications of that, a very intense disaster. Then there's drought, which is a slow-moving disaster, and that, that's, that's complex. I guess I'm saying that we add to that complexity even more by adding the notion of aridity. So are we seeing a long-term drying rather than a drought? And that makes it even more complex because we've got these trends at different time, time scales and how we think about that and how they interact together are in, inherently complex. If someone says, 
I'm leaving this rural community because of a drought, because I just am sick of dealing with drought. That's one thing. If somebody says I'm leaving because of aridity, because of things are getting drier and drier, that's another message that they're sending behind. And, and um, uh, how those messages go and how those go through the communication lines that, that Rob was talking about there, I think is an interesting and important point. So I have this quote, which I, which is, which I actually, again, um, I just collect these things from other people, but this quote came from um, Gabriel Chan, who was talking at Birchip on a, on a climate change and discussion. And she had this quote from Wendell Berry, the only true and effective operator's manual for Spaceship Earth is not a book that any human will ever write. It is hundreds and thousands of local cultures. And so again, this reinforces my point that this is what I think is really good about Farmers for Climate Action and these local forums is that this does need to be solved and how we manage these things have to be solved locally in terms of adaptation. Um, also, how do we, uh, we, we come across ways to reduce greenhouse gases in ways that are, that are fair and equitable and effective? Um, so this is, but there's this interesting challenge about what do we do at a local level and this is a global problem as well. So that we, how do we, how do we manage that as well? So um, the Goulburn Broken uh, catchment has has a, this very, um, yeah, a lot of work has gone into this, into into working out um, vulnerability in different um, sub regions and so on. Um, so um, I, I'm acknowledging this really important work. I'm not going to go through and just show, show you a whole lot of slides of that, but I would urge anybody to, to look at that. And if I'm looking at an out of date one here, I apologize um, greatly for that, but there's a lot of fantastic work that's gone, gone in here and a lot of community um, discussion and so on that's gone into, into this. Um, but this is also a global issue. And, uh, and I think uh, an important point to just quickly remind ourselves is that this is a global issue and we're talking about a mature science. So be cautious about somebody like me or, or I'm an agricultural scientist who works in climate, in climate applications or a, or a climate scientist who comes along and says, I've got this radically new information. To an extent, um, when, when, when Thomas Broker came and sp spoke at the Greenhouse Conference, he's sort of saying, this science is getting mature, other, in, in some ways from a journalist perspective, boring. We know what, we know some of these things. We know we're warming the world and, um, and we're repeating, more and more studies are, are, are repeating that. So basically what he's looking at there is a two degrees world and a four and a half degrees world, greater warming at the poles, greater warming inland, um, and then, um, quite concerning is this notion that a warmer world would be a wetter world. A warmer world would be a wetter world, except where, what I say in South Australia is a warmer world is a wetter world, except where you chose to inherit a farm or bought a farm. So the problem is that the drying in the mid latitudes here. And so what we see here is that the darker colors are at the poles and the equator but the mid latitudes tend to show a drying. And that's something you can see to an extent with all the, 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 the terrible fires in Australia, but also the fires in California, in Spain, in Mediterranean areas. There's this worrying drying happening across Mediterranean regions. And one of the, the, the concerns is that when you use the um, the latest climate models, rather than being a sort of, oops, we overstated this, it's more of a concern that there might have been understated. So there may be, be, be more warming um, and uh, as, as, as these more climate models build in some of the feedbacks and so on. So again, just going back to this simple, simple idea that how I find useful to think about this is the year-to-year -year variability versus the long-term um, changes. And, and that's really about short-term variability and drought, 
versus the longer term aridity, about a hot year versus warming. And I guess my simple, simple point is that we have much more confidence about the hot years and the warming. For Southern Australia, the worrying aspect is, are we seeing aridity and drying? So here's the Southern wet season. This is, this is the winter season for Southeastern Australia. And you can see there the millennium drought um, and it's pretty dramatic. Perhaps what's more concerning is since the millennium drought, you can only see two blue bars. The first one is the La Nina of 2010-11, which was a dramatic ending of the millennium drought, followed by 2016 there, which was the Indian Ocean Dipole Negative 2016. Now, there are some indications that 2020 will be another Indian Ocean Dipole Negative year, and it would be wonderful if it was another blue, blue line there. But even if it is, that's three blue lines since, for, for, since 2000, or since the beginning, and even the 1990s, late 1990s. So this, this, is, this is of a, now a lot of dryland farmers who I interact with have done very well and, and, in, and adapted extremely well to these conditions. And some of these years, are not that much drier than the long-term average, but obviously the concern about recharging um, uh, river systems and so on, those blue bars are very important. So there's concern about this long-term drying across Southern Australia. Now we don't, again, this is partly decadal variability, but it is consistent with some of those models and it's consistent in a broad sense at a continental and global sense of that diagram that I showed that Thomas Stocker was looking at um, uh, earlier. Going to the short-term variability, um, the Murray-Darling Basin drought update, this comes out regularly, that's updated fortnightly, it gives us information about, about what's happening um, and you can see now that uh, the southern basin is wetting up a bit. Although when I looked at this, I, I, was, I was surprised at just in some ways how these numbers are still pretty low in terms of the, um, the blue as, as how much is there, but also even just that how much has increased since the last fortnight. Now, systems, um, you know, there, there's um, the outlook from the Bureau is, is, is mixed, but pretty positive. And we would we would hope that those numbers would 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 be going up. But this is about short term variability, the wave, if you like. And I think there's really um, there's really good information. The the bureau and and the um, the and MDBA is making it, doing a good job of communicating that and understanding where that is. Um, this this is the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is the interesting aspect that everybody has their eyes on. So that this, so you can see there the Indian Ocean Dipole, um, just a, as a quick sort of point, when the IOD is positive, that's bad for us generally. And when it's negative, it's good for us. When we were just talking about El Nino and the Southern Oscillation Index, it was, it was easier because a positive SOI was good for us. You just have to sort of reverse that thinking, which is sometimes a little bit challenging, but you can see that, that what happens with a with a strongly positive Indian Ocean dipole is that we tend to be cooler off Australia and warmer off Africa there, and you get floods in Africa and this this drying and, and uh, in Australia. What where we are at the moment is we're bouncing around, but the suggestion is that there's a it's well worth watching but the suggestion is we may be heading back to more like 2016, where that would be negative, which gives us warmer waters, and that, and that has, a, has a better, um, much better outcome for us. There's also discussion about La Nina and so on. So there's a lot of information about the short term, the seasonal variability. I think these pro, there's, there's work that's getting better and better at that information. It's far, far from perfect, but we're understanding some of the drivers. Now let's talk about the long term, um, the tide, going back to the tide. So these were, this is a, an older report on the six main risks to Murray-Darling 
Darling Basin water was climate change, large scale tree planting. If we have lots of trees rather, rather than, um, than uh, pasture, they'll use more water, groundwater extraction, irrigation management, farm dams and bushfires. Now there's a, there's, I won't go into these in too much detail, but they're, they're, they're interacting in, in interesting ways in, in terms of um, even if warmer conditions, forests and, and, and land use will, will use more water under those warmer conditions, higher CO2, they may even grow, grow more at certain times and so on. It's a complicated story there. The groundwater extraction, just clearly, this is a, this is a complex and um, linked system. The irrigation management is an interesting one and people following that is that, yes, it's true that we need to, irrigators are getting more and more efficient. Some of that inefficiency where it's, where it's leaking back into the water table is, is a loss to the irrigator, but it's not a loss to the system. Um, whereas irrigation water that's evaporated is, is effectively a loss to, to, to the, whole system, the whole system. But um, Farm dams, a controversial aspect about where they are, and bushfires. One of the um, main costs of the Canberra bushfires was the impact on water, because new, new growth uses so much water. So these, these are complicated and interacting factors. The, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan um, has a climate change discussion paper, which is well worth reading. And what do they use as their... Um, sort of uh, guidance on this is these two large studies, which were done quite a while ago. So the Murray-Darling Basin Sustainable Yield Study projected the average volume of available water could decline by 11% by 2030. That, that's, there's a range between an increase or a very significant decrease. And then there was SIACI, which is a Southeast Australian Climate Initiative, Bureau of Meteorology and, and CSIRO did a lot of work here. And this, this is what they're quoting is that 1% increase in the mean global temperature by 2030 could lead to changes in mean annual runoff, minus two to minus 22% in the Southern Basin and a bigger range in, in the Northern Basin. Um, I guess my point here is that these are big ranges. Um, the outlook for the Southern Basin is, is still is worrying but it's between somewhere between, a, a, I guess, a minor reduction that could be picked up easily within efficiency and so on, and a major, major reduction. I guess what I say to the to, to groups that I'm talking to in irrigation is let's, let's plan for a warmer and water constrained world. Trying to be over precise in exactly what's going to happen is going to be difficult. And I'll, I think that's underpinned by the fact that we, that the, the, the uncertainty about rainfall. So just my quick um, understanding of what's happening in Shepparton, and obviously people from here are reading uh, from other areas as well, but a very um, a high em emphasis on dairy, apples, um, horticulture, these high value crops, all of which are vulnerable and, and uh, exposed to heat waves, to lack of water. This is from that report. For the, for the, for the Murray-Darling Basin is that increasing average temperature, increasing maximum temperature, increasing minimum temperature. I'll put a side note in there that we are getting in some, some areas more to the west of that region, there's this interesting aspect of um, increased frost numbers due to these dry springs. The number of hot days um, increasing this worrying aspect of the cool season rainfall decreasing, the snowfall decreasing. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been lots of snow this year. Again, this is about waves and tides. The soil moisture is decreasing. That means that when we do get rain, we have a, a, a dry soil, which, 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 which absorbs that. And I think that's the, 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 the ability to, re, to respond quickly. Evapotranspiration is increasing although not the increase in evapotranspiration for a degree warming is not as huge as you might first think. So the difference between evapotranspiration on a 30 degree day and a 40 degree day is very substantial or a 20 to 30 degrees, but we're not talking about 10 degrees. We're talking about 
one or two degrees in this initially, and this is this the, the differences there are in the order of four to four to five eight percent runoff decreasing, and that's the worrying aspect that that as we, these other factors compound on an a decrease in runoff. Extreme in um, intensity of rainfall increasing, um, time of drought increasing, and frequency of severe drought increasing. So clearly, the, these um, different metrics are, are not going the, the, the right way on the whole. So one way of thinking about future climates is that we get the climate change projections from the global climate models, and we run that through crop models and, and dairy farm system models. And it's been really interesting and important work done on that, and I've been involved with some of that with cropping models and so on. So that's this first one of the climate change projections. We can also do this sort of sensitivity analysis of how would the system handle stress testing? So how would we, we stress, how will we handle one, one and a half, two degrees warming, or different levels of rainfall decline. And I think that's a useful exercise to actually try and look at, given some of the deep uncertainty here, to look at some of the, the how we just handle some of the, these changes and so on. Th then I think there's this what idea of temporal analogs, the drought and the spatial analogs. And so what I've called this is these four aspects of thinking about the future. We can model the future and, and we, we, we've done that. We can play with the future or stress test the future. So if you like the, this, um, this vertical axis is more numerical and it's, it's looking at that way. But we can also remember the future. So how do we handle the drought? What, what have we learned from that? And we can visit the future. That is, what are areas that are warmer and drier than where we are? Warmer and more arid than where we are? So this is again from the Victoria work, which is based on some CSIRO work, is that in 2050, under high emissions, the climate of Shepparton be more like the climate of Griffith now, and Wangaratta and, and Benalla more like Dubbo. So you're basically using this idea, there's a, there's a tool you can use to look at how, how you may change in those ways. And clearly, um, there's agriculture at Griffith, but it's different to the agriculture at Shepparton. And uh, um, there's also important differences between the two as well. So we know we're getting warmer average temperatures. We have very high confidence in that. These extreme heat events, um, there's high confidence in that. The change in frost frequency and intensity, there's lower confidence in that in the coming decades because of this interaction with um, drier springs and so on. The change in seasonal rainfall is so vital and so important to this discussion, but the confidence in that is moderate. Um, it's worrying, but uncertain. The changes to the intensity of rainfall, there's higher confidence in that, that are, this is just basic physics, that a, a warmer world, um, you, you have a more intense hydrological cycle. And higher levels of CO2, very high confidence, we're certain about that. So we're, we're um, these first ones, the very high confidence, if you like, the first order factors, and then these other ones are a little bit more, there's a weather and a climate component. So um, how free heat frequencies, frost and seasonal rainfall, there's less confidence because if you like, they're a second order factor on this. So if you look, one way to think about this is that heat waves have both a climate component and a weather component. The climate component, we know the inland of Australia is much hotter. The weather component is when do we get those blocked high pressure systems um, that, will, that will block in the Tasman and bring those heat waves down. And that's, that's less clear than the actual understanding of the, of the initial warmth. So I want to finish by talking again through this really important point of what's happening with rainfall. Again, the trends are worrying. The trends are noisy. The trends are short term there. We don't just extrapolate the trends, but looking at those trends of what's happened since the millennium drought is, is, is concerning. So these are different models run for these, for these systems. And basically, the white bar in the middle is if there's very little change, minus five to plus five percent. And you can see that for the, the general broad region of which Shepparton is part, that look at the annual one over to the right there, is that quite a, that say 25 of the models, uh, of the 70 models, or a bit of 25, are saying 
plus or minus five percent. Um, then, but but there's a there's a skew to the dry side. So fewer model, very few models are going for a significant wetting. Now that's for annual. You can see for summer rainfall, it's more variable. Autumn, but winter and spring, there's this stronger skew to the drier side. So one way to look at this is like a pipe, like a like a wheel that we spin. We have if if we were if we were saying that that we, that climate change has no impact on rainfall, we'd say that we just spin this wheel, and we might say that we have a strong chance of it just being minus five to plus five. Of course, because of, of, of decadal variability in the coming decades, it might get wetter, it might get drier, it might get a lot wetter, it might get a lot drier, but it's most likely to stay in that sort of range. So we just spin this wheel and we have equal chance of this happening. What this report is saying is that the pattern on the wheel has changed. When we spin the wheel for September, October, November there, that's quite worrying because we're actually swinging that around to a much greater chance of a decline. We don't know exactly exactly where, where it will land, but the concern is of the 70 models that most of them are leaning towards the drier side in that, in that time. Again, there's uncertainty here. We may be lucky and it might be that it doesn't end up there, but we don't know that. One of the concerns, and this, this was an interesting article that Professor Matthew England had, uh, um, after the bushfire season, that the models of variability, so that's IOD and Southern Annular Mode, are not changing in a way that's good for Southeast Australia. We are stacking the dice for the chance of these extreme drought years because of the changes in these modes. So it's not, what he's saying is that, that this sort of second, third order interaction of how we're changing things seem to be affecting the IOD and the Southern Annular Mode in a way that's not as helpful. In terms of El Nino, which is a major and the major driver, the evidence there, as I would understand it, is more that there may be more intense La Ninas and El Ninos. Another worry is that uh, Michael Gross et al. in 2017 assessed those 70 models, so that those, those wheels I showed you and those diagrams based on the 70 models, and they used the 15 models that best represented the rain-bearing circulation for Southern Australia. These 15 models showed a stronger drying, especially in the winter. So again, I, I, I'm, I'm saying there's a lot of uncertainty here, but the, I'm trying to take it through to the argument as to why this is quite concerning because the, the models that seem to rep represent things better are, are, are showing this, so showing more drying. So there's my sort of quotable quote from Wendell Berry that um, the only manual for Spaceship Earth, these challenges, is the hundreds of thousands of local cultures. And I think it's really important that we respect the indigenous culture of the region, the many, uh, many, um, the, the multicultural cultures of the region, the, um, the many complexities that Gordon drew in his, um, in his diagram and so on there, how we interact with them in a discussion about this global aspect of climate change is, is a significant challenge, but I think a really good starting point is coming at that from a group like Farmers for Climate Action because, because of the grassroots aspect and so on. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's um, um, probably not uh, as uplifting as we might like, but it's pretty uh, important information and it's um, really interesting that quote that you had about um, the adaption being local, which is exactly what we're trying to achieve here is, is explain that to people that, um, uh, as Rob Gordon explained, they need to form community groups and keep communicating to try and work their way through some of these pretty intricate problems. Um, now, I don't have any exact questions for Peter at the moment, but that it's okay if people want to write them in the chat line or on the, on the uh, Slido. Uh, but I would mention that uh, there are re reviews into various aspects of climate change and, and irrigation and water availability and all sorts of things going on continuously. And 
at Farmers for Climate Change, we at Top Climate Action, we do attempt to um, monitor as much of this as we can. So if it's of help to uh, participants, uh, we can, as they come forward, send them out to you, if you're a member, and um, you'll probably see a lot of it in the media that we'll highlight as we go forward anyway. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Dennis Ginnivan. Uh, it's hard to define what Dennis is or does. <laughs> Dennis is a, uh, what I like to think of as a community facilitator. Uh, he was involved in... ...of where a community can um, work with their federal member. So obviously it's different in, in other parts of Australia and in other electorates and regions. I can use my experiences with uh, INDI as a, as a case study that may be of interest or relevance or maybe trigger some other sort of ideas that people may have about how they could do something in their own communities. It's not to suggest it's the only way to, to make things happen. Um, I'm also a member of a, a group called Totally Renewable Yakandanda, which is a small country town. Um, many of you may know it, but it's sort of about 25 minutes out of Wodonga, near Beechworth in the sort of hill country uh, to the northeast of uh, Wangaratta. Um, and just as a by by the by, it, that, that group has been doing some interesting things in getting the town to a point where energy, so this is just one element of a community deciding how they're gonna take care of things, but where the town has actually got a goal to get effectively off the grid by 2022. So it's in effect generating a renewable energy that will be more than what it, the town actually uses by 2022. Um, and more relevant to rural or farming communities, they've got a strategy of supporting the country fire authorities and you know, their sheds uh, to be equipped with um, solar and um, battery capability to protect themselves from um, outages and to enable them to be, uh, have a certain sense of confidence and um, assurance that uh, things, no matter what happens, that they'll be able to run their shed and their, and their service. And finally, I'm, I've been working with um, on some of the issues around climate change, major or major weather pattern changes and resilience projects in this region. And you'll probably be very aware of the, in the upper Murray region, the, the grid power went out for up to four weeks in some parts, as did the road access into that region post that fire. So there's been some fairly big um, challenges in those communities. And it also led to um, food, food insecurity as being an issue in that part of the world. So, the different circumstances, different issues facing different communities, and obviously the issue of um, you know, climate and drought and water policy, a lot of those things are probably more, more prescient in, um, in, uh, in, in Shep and, or, and surrounding areas. Um, so there's been, I won't go into the details of it, but I'm really keen to speak uh, with anyone who's interested in more, much more detail about some of the processes that uh, have been employed by the communities to get that voice heard. Um, and just in very brief terms, there's been models for ways in which discussion can be developed and led and to make sure that things don't get out of hand when you're speaking about politics. Sometimes, you know, sex, politics and religion don't go there, it's all too difficult. Well, on the other hand, there are ways in which good and positive, respectful conversations can occur to bring people together. And, um, and for, you, for you, if you feel that, that your voice is um, not, not strong enough, not heard, to bring, bring people around you to, together. So the challenge facing, well, I would argue, this process of um, interface between communities, individuals, groups, and the political uh, aspect uh, dimension has been the one of the challenges has been the declining number of people who are members of political parties. In fact, to get going with the football uh, club analogy, there's now more people in who are members of the Richmond Football Club than there are of um, 
uh, members of um, yeah, there's more people in the in in the in the Richmond Football Club than there are members of all the political parties combined. So that's an increasingly small number relative to the size of our population, and that's part of what I think is that this as, as time goes on, people may feel that more decisions are being made by a lesser number of people and who are often further away. There doesn't seem to be a door open at a community level to participate in democracy um, and to have a say and, and that no one's hearing what you want to say. There can be a disengagement and, the, and, and, and the cynicism about politics, which is not a good thing for us to have. I think it's really important for us to be um, continually supporting, encouraging, bringing people together and bringing a wider range of people to the to the, the discussion. Peter mentioned that some of those groups, multicultural groups, indigenous groups, but also I argue the, um, the uh, generational groups, but representatives from each of the generations, because it seems some of these challenges that we have and will have into the future aren't going to stop with, the, with, with us, with people of my age, really, we need to be bringing younger people into the debate and to, and to sort of be them for them to be part of the direction setting uh, into the future. It's really important that uh, that broader range of people get heard. Uh, and whilst farming is one group that's impacted by climate and uh, drought and water availability, as do many people who are not in the farming community who are, who are facing related issues, not maybe not in terms of water availability on the farm, for example, but they're, they're facing many issues for themselves. And I should say when it comes to communities, at the moment, I think there's about 100,000 people who are farmers, and there's about 4.9 million people who are, who are rural Australians. So five, 5 million rural Australians, 100,000 are farmers directly. So the the community, when we're talking about the power of a local community, necessarily involves bringing all those people together to get a collective voice to, for, for, for example, at a regional level around particular issues, bringing those people together will, meet, will make for a much stronger voice and really conscious that it is, or it can be difficult for someone who has been through difficult trauma uh, to be just able to drop everything else and say, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look after, I'll, I'll get involved with those issues. However, communities collectively can look out for the people who are doing it tough, for the ones who aren't able to come to a strong expression of their voice and opinion, to bring them together that way. So then you've got that collective voice. Um, so what can you do? Well, oh, well, I should say before that, um, so if, if that doesn't happen, um, politics will continue, you know, the, and the relationship with our, with our representatives will continue to slide. I think where there will be um, a, a developing sense of what politics is, it's all about what happens, what gets done to me in my name, rather than it being, what do I do to shape what happens to me? So there's an opportunity in there to turn it around and to reverse that idea of the game and the like a pro polarizing um, paralysis when it comes to that, that view of politics being a, con a contest between two major parties, two, two football teams. But rather, it's our relationship with politics is, is really what politics is as well. So we if we don't get involved, we will continue to be reacting to immediate crises that are happening to us and not strengthening ourselves and our community for future ones. Um, and if we're not directly involved, what are we doing? And for myself, I found myself shouting at the television recently or a number of years ago as being how I was interfacing with politics. This is before I got involved with a lot of these things I've been speaking about. There just didn't seem to be a way in which one could get involved. So to be angry at what you're hearing on TV or be angry 
having an, an internal view for yourself, but not actually being able to communicate that, not try to be able to strategize where you're to from here is really, I felt for myself, I just needed to do better. We need to, we need to step up and find a way to um, engage and, and for us to all collectively be responsible for our own outcomes. So what's the way forward or what's the potential way forward? And as I said, it's not prescriptive. It's probably we're putting out ideas for people to consider. Um, and that it does involve a community arising to express its voice and to be able to find its power to shape outcomes around us, whether they be like in integrity in politics, climate, bushfire recovery, policy on drought, energy. And citizens have a right as well as a responsibility to be part of all of this um, and also to be respectfully heard and to um, uh, be, be cordially and in, uh, warmly invited into participate. So I guess what in, in summary, I wanted to sort of put back to each person listening, um, how you're feeling about that sort of stuff to sort of have a bit of a sense of self reflection on whether that all seems too daunting or too, yet you're too busy. Um, or are you and your community sort of happy with the way things are going in relation to this or do you want to um, see, can you see opportunities to become more connected to the way in which your representatives uh, voice what it is that uh, we all, we, we say to them? Do you want to wish, do you wish to meet others who may we have similar concerns? Do you want to be part of a, a subsequent discussion group format around whatever it may be? It's not specifically to do with politics. It might be an issue that you're facing. So there's, um, our experiences in, in Indi, or my experiences in, in Indi has been one of what I'd call a movement from, from serious trepidation about even thinking about there's a good idea to get involved to a point of uh, a sense of transformation where there is this sort of other side where communities can find their voice. So I encourage you, to, if you wish to follow up any of the ideas and possibilities that you uh, may wish to discuss further, please make contact with me via Peter, our host, and I'm more than happy, uh, Peter, to um, take questions and comments as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, well, we have a couple of questions. Um, we will have a, uh, a final uh, message from Wendy, yeah. uh, but before we do that, we'll have, um, I've got a question here for Peter Heyman. Um, and it's from Verity Morgan Schmidt, and it talks about, uh, she says, love for your thoughts, uh, love your thoughts on models for adaptive learning systems for farmers that reflect the importance of locally led solutions as per Berry, but also facilitate diversified knowledge networks so we can learn beyond our own backyard. Who has good systems for this around the world and how can we do it better here? Did you get that, Peter? What's happening? Oh, Peter's not working. Okay. I can't hear you, Peter. Am I clear now? Ah, yes, you're Is talking now, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, now I can, yes. Can you hear me now? Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so Verity, that's a very, a really good question. I think, um, you know, I, I know that there are groups doing this and they are in, in other, other countries. I, I really think that um, there's a wonderful Churchill Fellowship or something for somebody from Farmers for Climate Action to go and look at other other groups doing something like this. So my, my answer is, I don't have a strong, but I think that it's really interesting seeing this, there's a lot that, in, in a lot of it, things I think we can learn from the developing world and the area of, um, of rural development. They've thought about some of these issues and the, the community, 
the whole idea of beyond pharma first um, uh, and, and so on. So just think that uh, um, Dennis is Waited. So sorry, I, I'm sorry, I guys, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, Peter. You dropped out there for a while. Although you look like you're stalling all the time. Yeah. Okay. So um answer is I think that uh, try, try turning your video other off, agricultural Peter. groups and farming groups but also turn the video off okay yeah that might okay is that is that clear your voice is clear now yeah, I think. okay um okay I'll be really quick I, I think Verity learning from other uh, um, agricultural and, and farming groups. But I think Dennis's point of there being um, more than farming in rural communities, I think it's a nice one. What do we learn from health? What do we learn from some other areas and so on as well on this about, about how we... we, we, we I, I, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a really good question. Of, of how we can share ideas across those different ones. And that's why I'm saying that someone should get a Churchill Fellowship and go and study it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. That's a bit difficult, but we did get the message. Um, now, hoping everybody can still hear me. Um, we have a bit of um, free advertising to do. Um, Mr. Mark Merritt has um, suggested that uh, people should look at the Vanishing River, the Vanishing River, one word, dot com dot au website, which has done a lot of work on um, on, on uh, water in the Murray Darling many new lakes, and it might be of interest. And Mark's put his phone number there. I won't read it out, um, but if anybody wants to contact Mark, give me a call, and I'll pass it on then. Uh, what else we got in mind here? Looks like that's all the questions we have for the moment. So I'll um, see if I can locate Wendy. I'm here. Uh, Wendy is there, good. <laughs> uh, and hopefully yours are working all right. I'll uh, throw to you, Wendy, for the wrap up. Yeah. I think the one thing that we do have in Canberra that's okay is uh, internet. So hopefully I'm coming to you loud and clear. Um, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Peter. I think there were some really fascinating discussions today. And uh, I know that everyone um, got an enormous amount out of that. So thank you so much. The presentations, just for everyone's um, knowledge, will be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, Pete will follow up uh, today for him with, with an email, which will have some links for those presentations. And you're very welcome to share them amongst um, your your uh, friends and colleagues. Um, we've heard uh, of, of some of the many challenges that we've faced together uh, today as a result of climate impacted weather crises and uh, weather related disasters. We've heard about the impact on health and well-being of these disasters and the, the way that uh, the ways that we can work together and as businesses and farms to mitigate the impacts of climate change, increase uh, our understanding of uh, ac accessing water, um, using it uh, more efficiently. And as Dennis outlined, working together, communities um, can create a really unified and powerful response and help build resilient and sustainable rural and regional Australia. I'm actually really fascinated by the Totally, Yakin, um, totally Renewable Yakindanda project. It's a, it's a really wonderful and uh, very, um, clearly articulated example of how communities can find their own voice and deliver a vision for a much better and much more owned result locally. Um, but this is just the beginning and, and, and there, um, we, I think we need to, to work with you more to talk about some ways that you can become involved as individuals and as also as a community. 
um, some ideas that, that, that we've seen work really effectively previously, um, form a community group, form um, some networks and structures locally to take action in your region. And this includes, um, you know, utilising or using smart uh, climate smart practices and principles. Reach out to friends, neighbours, workmates, colleagues, peers, anyone you know who you think will be uh, receptive to, to what um, you'd like to chat to them about with regards to, to taking climate action. Build the network, spread the word, and engage with your elected representatives at all levels of government and help change the politics. But let's keep talking. Let's see this as a, a, a start point for ways that we can have um, uh, regular uh, two-way communications about the ways that your community can come together um, and turning to some of Dennis's wonderful examples. Farmers for Climate Action also has some yard signs available. So you can be in touch with us uh, either via Facebook or uh, via email, which is uh, the address is info at farmersforclimateaction.org.au. Uh, these signs are a really simple but um, easy way to demonstrate your support for climate action and they're a great conversation starter, a powerful way to spread the message. So we'd love to get some of those out for you to use. Uh, thanks again so much to our wonderful speakers and uh, to, to Pete Holding for organising this forum and thank you all for attending. Thank you, Wendy.